that infuriates me, the whole statin cholesterol discussion, because people just need to spend time and research this and listen to scientists and physicians that are here, grassroots efforts trying to get the word out. Why? Because we're fighting against trillion dollar industries here. Hey guys, thank you so much for supporting us and watching our videos. If you'd like to support us some more and get some of our merchandise like this awesome apron, be sure to check out our website at thecarnivalrevolution.com. Hey everybody, welcome to The Carnivore Revolution. I'm Serena and today my guest is Dr. Lisa Wiedemann. You guys know her as the carnivore doctor on Instagram and on YouTube. She is an eye doctor and I am really excited to talk with her today about the carnivore diet and the way it benefits our health. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Serena. You know, I'm very passionate to be here. And as somebody who's, I'm just short of 15 years of eating carnivore now, I feel that I have a duty <laughs> to try to really um, spread my experience really out there for anybody who's interested in, you know, people don't come to this lately. I'm sure I didn't. I know you didn't. And mm -hmm. anybody watching this thinking of it or having started it, there's a reason behind it because mm -hmm. this is just kind of, you know, as, as much as it seems so bizarre and strange, we're the ones eating normally, everybody else eating all that other standard atrocious diet food are the ones that are eating strangely. So we have to remember that. But yeah, my my backstory really comes from um, a very long, I'll say lifelong um, battle with carb and sugar addiction and disordered eating. I struggled for so long. I couldn't understand why I was so compelled to keep doing this and kept searching for an answer and couldn't figure it out. And, you know, my my parents are obese. My brother's obese. I struggle with my weight. And it was one weird diet after another, you know, between cabbage soup diet. And, you know, there was Atkins, which was the closest that you could come really to the first two weeks of induction of Atkins was as close as you could get to carnivore really, or actually carnivore. But um, other than that, it was all the, you know, every, anything and everything to try to figure out why I was not able to um, lose weight, control my weight, control my eating and control my compulsion to uh, overeat. So I was fortunate. I was diligent after 30 years of struggling though, to have found on the internet long time ago, 2009, it was Charles Washington and a small group of people who have had at the time spun off of a very popular low carb forum and they kind of got kicked off the low carb forum because their zero carb thread got so large that they got ousted off and Charles said, well, going to start my own forum and have a place for all of us to talk. And I came upon that group and there was people in there who were resolving their issues left and right. And particularly what drew my attention was there were a couple of women in there who were outspoken and outwardly talking about how this resolved their disordered eating. And I was like, okay, I'm all in. This mm -hmm. sounds crazy, but let me join you wacky weed meat eaters. <laughs> And so, yeah, March 9th, 2009, I, um, I, there was no looking back because I said, you know what, this seems crazy. I don't know if it's healthy, but I got to give it a try because I've suffered for so long and I will continue to research along the way and figure out if what I'm doing is healthy or not. And fortunately, as time went on and I was feeling great and better and better and more and more people were doing this and having great outcomes. And then, um, yeah, I started, I wanted to tell the world because this is great. You know, I'm finally free of cravings and free of this horrible problem and feeling great, but nobody really wants to listen. <laughs> nobody, unless they have their own personal why that makes them cry, their own personal struggle, uh, with health or food issues or whatever it is. So 
yeah, I, 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 I kind of just settled into this was my way of life. And I was pretty quiet about it because this was really before Facebook Mm -hmm. and Instagram and YouTube. So it, it became apparent to me that I needed to step up when it was when the popularity of this rose with Sean Baker on the Mm -hmm. Joe Rogan, Michaela Peterson and Jordan Peterson and a a combination of things. So I got perked up and interested, like, wow, look, they're coming on my team. (laughs) So I, but then I would read in the comments and people say, well, that's all well and good until you kill yourself with a heart attack. That's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Can't possibly do that long-term. And I was like, uh, (laughs) wait a minute, here I am. So just by happenstance, I decided to make a separate Instagram name so that I can just follow carnivore-ish zero carb things. Mm -hmm. And, um, it just grew and grew because I kept making comments places and saying, no, no, you guys, yeah, no, this is awesome. And, um, and then over on Facebook, there was a big growing group with, um, zeroing in on health and zero carb health. Um, Charles Washington, Dana Spencer was also one of the original, I call the OGs. And, and back when I'm in this forum long ago, though, as more and more people were kind of coming in, Kelly Hogan came into the group and she had her struggles and we were Mm -hmm. trying to coach her out of her craziness. And, you know, it just, it was us, the originals back then that, you know, there's no manual for this. Mm -hmm. And it was like, well, none of us were using salt or electrolytes, um, salting our food to taste most of us. But then we read, um, Owsley, the bear Stanley's writings, he had been doing this at the time, probably 30 years. Mm-hmm. And he was against the use of salt. And again, there was no companies that mass produced these electrolytes, which yeah. became even more enticing because of the sweetener put in the flavors put in. And now all of a sudden you got people hooked on and the marketing to say, yeah, you got to have your electrolytes. Or else, what are you going to do about your cramps and your keto flu and all that? I'm like, well, guess what? We didn't have any of that. And yeah, we had a little chit chat about some leg cramps and Mm -hmm. it goes away though. Our bodies are remarkable at adapting to what we're doing. And when we put something exogenously into our body, our body actually has to counteract what we're putting in. So it's a very... um, You have to really think about these things because our bodies are incredible at being here to evolve and heal as long as you remove the toxins, which for us, it really is the sugar, the grains, the seed oils, the processed foods. I mean, that's the biggies, right? If you're, you know, feeling like you need to eat vegetables and that's a whole nother category of conflicting information, right? Because you got the keto people or you got the plant-based people, or you have us carnivores who are saying, you know, for many people, there's many things in plants that make it so that they don't get eaten. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we shouldn't be having, you know, and yeah, I just kept going on day by day. I just said, you know what, I'm still feeling great. And, you know, here I am almost 15 years in and Mm -hmm. I'm 59 years old and I feel like I can just conquer the world. You know, I'm lifting weights, I'm walking, I'm trying to do all of the biohacking things of getting sunlight in the morning, trying to ground, different things like that. But for the most part, I think for most people, it's very difficult to even imagine eliminating something as simple as bread. Yeah. Like, and I remember back I used to love toasted bagels when we went out to the diner for breakfast. It's mm-hmm. like, wait, what? Can't have bagels anymore? Why? Yeah. And and it's a whole process. It's a whole journey. It's a whole, you know, and, and everybody's so different because they come from different ways of coming into it. Health, mental issues, depression, anxiety. I mean, this skin issues, arthritis, diabetes, you know, we could just go on and on. and. I will say basically everything that is going wrong in our bodies is caused by the culprits that we just said, 
seed mm-hmm. oils, processed food, which is lots of the seed oils mixed with sugar and salt, right? Grains, which are really not natural to our bodies and and sugars, which are inflammatory, tend to feed cancer cells. So if we get rid of that, you know, it, that allows our bodies to at least try to get to a normal state, not quickly, because I tell people, they'll say, well, I've been doing this for six weeks and I still blah, blah, blah. I go, well, really? Guess what? You ate crap for six decades and <laughs> give your body a chance here, but it's hard. It's it, The whole process is difficult because everything around us is screaming to stay in that same pattern of habits, of traditions, of holidays, of eating, of friends, of socialization. It makes it so difficult to try to say, you know what? I want to do this for my health. I think this is the healthiest thing that I could possibly do. And now I need to do it. I say the rules are simple. Execution is not easy. Not at all. It's really not. And let's talk about that addiction thing for a minute, because I was talking to somebody yesterday and we were talking about the addiction thing in general and how food addiction for most people, and people are going to argue with this, but it is if you are a food addict or a carb addict or sugar addict, quitting those things and being an addict itself is harder than being an alcoholic or a drug addict, in my opinion. I've never been an alcoholic or a drug addict. But I know that as an alcoholic or a drug addict, you can go places, lots and lots of places, most places where people won't be drinking and people won't be using drugs, right? And won't be pushing it on you, knowing you are a abstinent, recovering, recovered person from said drug. Yes, that's exactly right. So if somebody's an alcoholic and you happen to be at a party where there's alcohol and people know that you're an alcoholic, they're not going to say, oh, come on, just have a beer. Oh, one isn't going to hurt you. You only live once. Yes. But if you're a sugar or a food or a carb addict, every single place you go, every function that we have as human beings revolves around food, basically. Everything we do, everywhere we go revolves around food. And don't you agree with that, that it is just, it seems like it would be so much harder because you can't abstain from food. For sure. And I tell, you know, just in, to your point, you can't even go into Home Depot to buy a hammer without seeing the latest M&Ms stuffed with salted caramel or brownie or the Kit Kats that now have crushed potato chips inside them, right? So Whoa. it's a whole different level of of dealing with an addictive substance. And, and the big part of the problem is m- most people do not recognize this as an addiction at all. Yeah. And unless you've suffered it and walked the walk, yeah, it's it's a really tough road. Uh, and you know, for in in my coaching groups when I talk to people about the difficulty of this and because they say why do I keep relapsing into this and I said, "Well, what's your home life like? You mm-hmm. know, other people in your household still eating these things, right? And it's like having temptations around you all the time. And it's like, you got to try to get them out of your house, have a heart to heart, talk about how important this is, but it's very difficult because who are we, who gives us the right to dictate what somebody else eats or doesn't eat. So that's a whole different thing, but yeah, the, the level of difficulty of this because of how normalized it is. Everybody eats pizza. Everybody eats ice cream. Don't Mm -hmm. you have dessert after dinner, Mm -hmm. right? It's so normalized and it's so toxic and it's basically a slow suicide for everybody, but not everybody realizes that. So that's a big problem. Yeah. And, and it's cliche, I know, but every bite we take is either feeding disease or fighting it. And we are, I love what you said earlier, that we are the ones that are really eating normally. We, we are not the ones that necessarily have an odd diet. It's just odd in today's society, but we are the ones that are eating whole foods. And yet we get labeled that we're on a diet and we're doing something extreme. Right. Ancestrally, we were normal. You man hunted animals and ate them. And the interesting thing is there's, it's so often we get attacked and uh, attack might be a strong word. Um, I think it's pretty accurate. Verbalize, verbally 
tantalized about this or, or um, let's just say questioned. And I think the, the biggest problem when we feel we are being attacked, we automatically go on the defense and we don't owe anybody an explanation and we really shouldn't have to defend ourselves. We shouldn't have to defend the way we have decided is the healthiest for us to eat. Mm-hmm. But that's very difficult. It it really is difficult because we as humans want to belong. We are social beings and we want to feel like we fit in. We don't want to feel like the outcast. We don't want to feel like somebody is thinking negatively of us. So all of that plays into it also, which again, escalates the difficulty of this. And it that's you know one of the reasons why I so strongly um, feel because I know I couldn't have made it without my little group back 15 years ago. I clung to the words. I'd, I'd go to my computer after I got my kids to bed and I'd be like communicating with like-minded people who had the same health goals in mind. So yeah. that's what I've, you know, I've, I've dedicated really the past three years to running groups and to bring people together to talk about all of these situations, the difficult social situations, maybe any difficulties you're having, the stalls, is this normal? Why is this happening? Just to be able to communicate. Cause if you're just sitting home with your spouse and and kids, there's there's no discussing this because they are all thinking you're wacky and that you should be not eating this way. So forget about sticking with it at that point. So it, you know, if if you make it through the transition and let's say the first 90 days, you will be at a point where you will have at least your own sense of. I'm doing the right thing. My body is indicating to me by all these different signs, less aches and pains. My skin is clear. I'm dropping some weight. I've got energy. Like all these things are positive changes. You're not doing something wrong. And, and I will say that it, the beginning, it's, it's a lot better just to try to fly under the radar don't fly your freak flag too early, even if you get excited about it, because the less you talk about it, the less you say about it, the better off you are until you actually really are able to pick and choose people who are genuinely curious. They'll go, oh my gosh, you're looking great. What are you doing? I want to know. And you will understand if they are genuinely interested or if they're going to start harassing you about, well, you can't possibly think that's healthy. You're going to kill yourself. You're going to have a heart attack. Well, you know what? It's funny. Nobody said anything when I was eating donuts and pop tarts, ice cream, and pizza. You didn't care Mm -hmm. then, but now all of a sudden you're concerned. I'm going to have a heart attack when I'm eating the ancestral natural diet. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So how strict are you? Do you eat anything besides like meat and some dairy or, um, like, do you ever eat some vegetables or are you just strictly carnivore? Yeah, I try to, uh, you know, my my main diet is meat, seafood, and eggs. Okay, and I I have over time decided that dairy is not my friend. I mm-hmm. love dairy. Guess what? Doctor Lisa does not have sober behavior around fried cheese, right? All of fresh mozzarella. If I'm putting beautiful sharp cheddar in my scrambled eggs. I want to eat more. There is this, it, and there are queso morphines and, you know, it's an mm-hmm. opioid yeah. thing and you can Google this there. It is, it is actually addictive. And who are we as animals, the only species to now eat the dairy of another animal? Mm-hmm. Pretty much. I've been called out on that. And they said, yeah. no, no, my goat will go over to my, and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> but in general, it's, it, it can be inflammatory. There are there, I know Sophia Clemens over at PKD in Hungary with her big program for treating, you know, very seriously ill people with a very strict form of a type of lion diet, basically, you know, mm. eat and water. Um, 
has has said that dairy is is implicated in increased risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer. And many people have reactions to dairy, skin issues, postnasal drip, all these things. I don't, unfortunately, I kind of wish I did have a reaction yeah. to it. You're so you're giving it more of an incentive, but I don't keep it in my refrigerator anymore. I do so. In answer to your question about how strict, so you brought up the word dairy, so that's just of course. Yeah, that's fine. Me yeah, because like I gotta say my dairy thing now because yeah, I do. I have a love hate relationship with it because I love it so much that yeah. I hate that I need to give it up. But so that's beside the point. But if I go out for a burger, I will get a bacon cheddar burger and have a nice slice of old English cheddar on my burger, right? Why? Portion control. I don't have control to go back in their kitchen and get more. So I'm fine having the slice, right? So as far as foods outside of meat, seafood, and eggs, an occasional restaurant dairy, let's say, or if I'm at a wedding and there's a cheese platter for the hors d'oeuvres and there's not much else I can have, like I have these exceptions, but yeah. it's in a very controlled, thought out exception. So the any only other thing is if I am getting, let's say, a raw tuna tatar, and it comes with a beautiful, fresh sliced avocado pieces with it. I will have a little avocado <laughs> or a charcuterie board with some olives. I happen to like olives. <laughs> I don't think either an avocado or an olive is going to be detrimental to my health. And so I enjoy them when I'm out and I will have that, but that's pretty much it. There is nothing else that goes in unless it's meat seafood, eggs, and those little slight exceptions um, on very slight occasions. And it part of it's because that's how I feel good. And I can even overeat vegetables. So that's, that's where I'm at with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a friend one time tell me after I had eaten one of those giant, you know, the giant bags of kale from Sam's, the giant ones, I had cooked it with some coconut oil and some salt and I ate all of it. Like I ate the whole bag. I had to make more for my family. Luckily, I bought two of them that time when I shopped because I, I knew that we love the sauteed kale. Um, and I ate the entire bag. I was sick for days. And I remember a friend saying to me, I've never heard anybody feel guilty about eating too much kale. And I was like, well, you didn't eat an entire bag of kale. I mean, I was literally sick for two days. I was miserable. My stomach hurt. Oh my goodness. I was miserable from that. So I, I understand what you're saying. I can overdo. I, I have been known to overdo the vegetables too. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a sad, sad scenario to think, man, I can't even have normal behavior around that. But the beautiful, happy thing is, is that those things have anti-nutrients in them that I really don't even want to put in my body now. So yeah. I'm really happy, happy about that. But the other thing that I will bring up that so many people will talk about is the, um, the sweeteners and artificial sweeteners, but then people are talking, they don't list stevia in that category because I guess it's a natural sweetener. I, I don't care what you say. It hits the sweet sensors on the tongue. It keeps the cravings alive. I don't feel for anybody who has any sort of significant food relationship issue, cravings for sweets, problem in the past with sweets that you should be putting any taste of sweet in your mouth if you want to get totally free from from that. It's, you know, I say, okay, you get off sugar and people are like, well, fruit too? I'm like, well, yeah, you know what? If I were cleaning a quart of strawberries for my kids, every other one went in my mouth. Yeah. I done, I, you know, and this is my experience. Maybe somebody's different. Maybe you can have a little handful of blueberries. I want three handfuls. And then I want to look and see if there's another handful. Yeah, okay. That's, that's the problem. Same thing with nuts. I can't, can't have sober behavior around nuts. Mm -hmm. I can't don't know why I can't. So it's totally off. Well, it's because you're an abstainer. You're an abstainer. That's yeah. why, you know, we have to abstain from everything because we can't have just one can't moderate it. Well, and that's the same for anything like, you know, people, I, I keep bringing it back to when, when people in my groups are saying, look, can I just have my electrolyte, you know, flavored electrolyte? I'm like, well, what's happening? You, you having that in your every single day? Are you ever drinking plain water anymore? And they're like, 
well, now that you mention it, <laughs> you know, are you, are you putting it in your coffee every day? Are you, you know, and I'd go down the way, are you chewing gum? Have you given up the diet soda? It's on and on and on. It's, mm -hmm. it's a problem because you're driven to continue to, you know, just crave and strive to get that taste of sweet. And I say, it's like just changing seats on the Titanic when you get off sugar and you get onto stevia, where are you at? And, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you're in perfect health, no diagnosis, no medication, feeling great, ideal body weight, and you can handle and moderate a little bit of stevia in your electrolyte water, then I, I guess that's okay. I'm not judging. I'm mm -hmm. just going by my experience. Yeah. So let's talk about eye health for a few minutes. So how is it that a carnivore diet can actually help improve the health of somebody's eyes? Yeah. Now this is so interesting that obviously people know, who know that I'm an eye doctor and know my long history of carnivore will frequently write to me and I get probably a hundred messages a day, just various messages. But a lot of them are, I have this glaucoma, dry eye, macular pucker, macular degeneration, cataracts, you know, on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Will carnivore cure that? Right. Mm -hmm. So my, my blanket response to you listening to my answer now is think about this. I'm an eye doctor. I'm in my exam room. Okay. Are you thinking somebody's sitting there who's, let's say, got the starts of cataracts, which everybody gets? It's slow, it's gradual. But am I going to say, you know what? You should try this really interesting, crazy, weird, fly your freak flag diet and only eat meat, seafood, and eggs and dairy if you tolerate it. And come back in six months and let me see if they've slowed down or reversed, right? That's not happening, mm -hmm. right? Same thing with somebody who's a glaucoma suspect. Mm -hmm. Am I telling them, all right, do this thing and come back and let me evaluate you. How about somebody with severe dry eye? You know what? Why don't you give up pasta and bread and rice and everything else except for meat and seafood mm -hmm. and eggs and come back and let's see if you're right. So. It's interesting to think about it that way, right? Like, mm -hmm. how would I possibly know unless, and now listen to this part of it, because of people knowing what I do and those people who happen to have come to carnivore for another reason mm -hmm. and are now carnivore for whatever, six months, two years, three years, will write to me and say, this was the greatest thing. I used to have floaters that were so bad. Three months into carnivore, because I was trying to resolve my diabetes, huh, my floaters are gone. I've had people report their prescriptions have lessened each time they've gone to the doctor. I've had people report who had glaucoma or glaucoma suspect. They were coming in for successive visits, carnivore for another reason, reporting this to my doctor took me off the glaucoma suspect diagnosis. I personally, because I got to the point as more years went on and I saw how incredibly powerful our bodies want to heal once we remove all the toxins, all that noxious food, the processed garbage stuff. Once that's removed, it allows the body to heal. Guess what? It's going to heal every organ system. It's not going to just heal your skin and your psoriasis, but ignore your dry eye. It's not going sense. to attack your heart and make you have a heart attack. Yet all these other things are remarkably improving. Say, oh, we'll just nab her in the heart though. It's not the case. And then people come at me. So I'll, I'll just say that I've had some patients who I could tell were at their wits end with severe blepharitis, meibomianitis, dry eye, chalazian. If anybody who's listening has mm -hmm. suffered from any of that, you know what I'm talking about. Miserable, red, irritated eyes, ongoing, chronic, <clears throat> horrible. I told this person, I know this sounds really crazy, 
Don't tell anybody I told you, <laughs> but why don't you look into this? And here I'm on Instagram. Why don't you follow me if you need any help? Uh -huh. This person who is local in, in my area, I ended up have, hosting a meetup randomly, like six months later. I didn't even realize he was one of the responders and mm -hmm. showed up the first meetup I had, I hosted right here because it was during right after the quarantine lockdown was mm -hmm. up. He comes in, he goes, do you remember me? I go, you look familiar. He goes, I'm your patient. You're the, you told me to, he goes, I dropped 40 pounds. I weigh the same as I did in high school. My eyes have never been better. I, I just wanted to come here and personally hug you and thank you. And That's I was amazing. like, wow. And I've had, I have a couple other stories similar to that mm -hmm. with a, a woman who had very severe, um, autoimmune issue and had uveitis. It's an inflammation. Uh, she had it in both eyes, which is an indication that it's a systemic issue. And she was at her wits end. Her rheumatologist wasn't able to help her. She was telling me, she goes, I'm about ready to just start juicing or something. And I go, Ooh, you know what? I know this is going to sound crazy. Another story. She literally came in for her one month follow-up in tears of happiness and hugged me and said, you've changed my life. I can't Amazing. even tell you how not only her eyes, but the aches and pains. And she was mm -hmm. only like 40, early forties. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so I became even more of a proponent of, you know what? We have to get this message out. We have to get people to understand. I know this seems strange, but it's not strange. It's delicious. It's not restrictive. It's mm -hmm. so freeing. Yeah. I can eat all these different ribs and oxtail and steaks and you name it. It's, mm -hmm. it's really an amazing way, simple, but it's so hard because of our lifestyles, our cultures, our family, our traditions, our holidays. And I get that. And that's where this little struggle comes into play. And that's where I feel like the, the, the community is just so powerful going mm -hmm. to meetups. I know I met you in person mm -hmm. at um, the meetup in Denver, Colorado, yeah. and it's so empowering. They're magical just mm -hmm. to be able to connect yeah. whether it's on zoom or in person. And I'm, I host a meetup every year here in New Jersey, it's getting bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm on a mission to host a meetup in every state. I'm probably about, I think I've got eight states done right now, but, um, it's because I feel it's that important mm -hmm. of the connection, because if not, we feel so isolated. We feel strange. We feel alone because there's not a lot of people out here doing this. No. Yeah. Or I think, yeah. I think the meetups are great. I think it's a great way to get to know people. Um, and I know one of the other big questions that people always have is heart disease, heart attacks, cholesterol, you know, all of those things. So why is it being a carnivore or eating lots and lots of meat, particularly red meat on a low carb diet does not cause problems for us in the way that people think that it does. Well, the, the big issue is it's gotten demonized incorrectly, erroneously by mainstream media, but we don't even have to get into the whole political mm -hmm. issue and connection with that. It's just horrible that we've been brainwashed. And the more you listen, the more you fret and fear cholesterol, guess what? Every cell in our body needs cholesterol. Our brain needs cholesterol. Our hormones need cholesterol. Our body makes cholesterol if we don't eat it, okay? And the more we eat, the body responds by making less. It's remarkable. So what makes me think if I am removing all of the toxic part of what at least you and I believe are toxic to us, and we're eating meat, seafood, eggs. What makes me think that my body is going to attack my heart, is going to elevate my LDL and therefore make me ill? There's studies that show a low LDL is a higher death rate. You actually don't want your LDL low. And the lowest death rate is between 180 and 280 uh, with, with LDL and people are like, oh, you know, the doctor, they're quick to write the script. Everybody goes on a statin. If you are in that boat and you think that's correct, you need to go onto YouTube and start doing your homework. And I, I mean, I, 
in my group, I have a whole section about cholesterol and statins and a lot of resources of carnivore and keto eating and your cholesterol levels. And the flip side too, is just say, don't measure it. Mm -hmm. What are you measuring your blood for? Did we measure our blood all those years ago? Were we concerned? You should be concerned if you're eating pop tarts and cookies and pizza and ice cream, then yeah, maybe you should get tested, but I have no use for the medical system. And I'm so happy to not even care what my cholesterol is because Mm -hmm. I'm so confident that my body is not going into a diseased state now that I've removed all of this garbage food. So I I know that doesn't put people's mind at rest because yes, I do have some people where they go, my cholesterol is 350 and my doctor's freaking out and they're insisting I go on a stat and I go, okay, well, you know what? Let's look at all your numbers. Let's look at your Mm -hmm. HDL, your triglyceride, Let's look at everything and let's put this into these ratios, calculate them. I have ways to look at your blood work. You personally at home, outside of your doctor's office, and these ratios were are from cardiologists. And if this over this is less than 4.44, you're good. If this over this is mm-hmm. greater than blah, blah, blah. Like there's all these criteria. And if all of those are good, but your doctor is just spitting out and spewing the pharmaceutical industry's narrative to make them trillions of dollars, Mm -hmm. then you got to wisen up and you got to take control of your own health and learn these things and, you know, get a new doctor. Mm -hmm. Or if you feel like you want to go in there and try to defend your position, they will sometimes, if you decline the statin, they will sometimes excuse you from the practice because if they don't keep a certain percentage of patients who have a cholesterol of this level or more are that are not on statins, they get docked in their mm-hmm. bonus pay. It's yeah. terrible. And it is. It's you have to really be your own health advocate. Yeah. And aren't the statistics something like um if you go on a statin for your cholesterol to try to lower it, at the most you gain something like two days to your life. Or something. Yeah. And, and the other thing is that for the very, very small amount of people that could actually benefit from a statin, one of the criteria is that you've already had a heart attack mm-hmm. to be in that category, to have, to be, be able to benefit from it. But, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, it, it, that infuriates me, the whole statin cholesterol discussion, because people just need to spend time and and research this and listen to Mm -hmm. scientists and physicians that are here, grassroots efforts, trying to get the word out. Why? Because we're fighting against trillion dollar industries here, healthcare and pharmaceutical. Um, It's, it's a big battle. And unless you actually take control, you're going to be just a statistic and they don't care about the Mm -hmm. side effects. They don't care anything other than you are going to perpetually purchase that medication and they are just rubbing their hands together. A happy, happy, happy. That's right. So if you had one piece of advice to people, what would it be? Wow. (laughs) Eat meat. (laughs) Well, that's quick and easy. Yeah. No. And I say lift weights, eat steaks. That's another um, one of my sayings. And I'm also become um, well known for my I guess my fairly blunt, um, simple outlook on this, it's not easy. If this were easy, everybody'd have a flat stomach, everybody'd be in great shape and everybody'd be in perfect health, right? What's not easy is because we're fighting against the addictiveness of it. And whether you think it's addictive or not, go ahead and try to give it up for 90 days and just see for yourself, right? But it, it it, I say, you know, nothing really truly worthwhile in life comes easy. Right. Change is hard. And so my saying that I say quite a bit is suck it up, buttercup. That's right. Let's go. You're in for a ride, but it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Dr. Lisa, this was a huge pleasure. I appreciate you being with me today. I think you have great information for people. Yeah. Thanks so much, Serena. And if you don't mind, I'll give you the um, the link for people if they if you'd like to join yeah. into my my group meetings um, in January, I am meeting live with the members every single day. 
You can ask questions every day. I pride myself on keeping the group small and I am there truly. I just want to help, encourage, inspire, and motivate and and get you through the tough times yeah. so that you can have this great outlook on life like you and I do. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, share the link. You want you want me to just put it in the show notes? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, thank you so much. And we'll see you next time here on the Carnival Revolution. Bye.